this talk is going to be partly historical. So let me open with a couple of ideas, major ideas in the history of mathematics. So certainly one major idea was the idea of a group, which clearly belongs to the 19th century, um, from its first inception to its development. And uh, by the end of the 19th century, uh, I think it's fair to say that most of the groups we know today had been uh, uh, explored. Um, another one is the idea of homology, which is clearly an idea of the 20th century, uh, although it has precursors in the 19th century. And um, it's by now, well, there's a list, a random list of types of homology that have been de uh, developed as the century has gone on. There are many more. Uh, I think you can say that it's entered almost every field of mathematics. So uh, I wonder if anyone here is brave enough to speculate if there are ideas of this level uh, out there which are going to similarly grow in the, in the 21st century. Right. <laughs> good, good, we have a brave person. Yeah, I think that's a, in fact, you could almost say that it's entered many fields of mathematics even now. Um, I was waiting for the definition like those things. Yeah, yeah, in some sense, uh, it's, a, it's a different situation because it's not clear why all the appearances of the word quantum in mathematics are parallel to each other. But anyhow, about bravery of speculation, uh, um, most people would say, well, let's let history see. But uh, Poincaré was brave enough. Um, topology as a subject began clearly with a series of papers of, of, of Poincaré, which are 100 years old. Uh, the, um, there were precursors in some conversations between Riemann and Betty, and uh, uh, the idea of, of homology sort of came out of those. But uh, after Poincaré's papers, then you can just see it, it uh, mushrooms immediately. Uh, gr great debates, many people start turning to it as their main, uh, main field of study. Poincaré, in this original paper, had the insight to say that the reason for studying topology was, was that um, it, it will be applicable in many different areas of mathematics. So he said uh, uh, in, in his beautiful introduction um, that he would restrict himself to only mentioning three and the three he mentioned were algebraic geometry, which is really goes back to Riemann, um, analysis ODEs, actually in his case, in the case of his problem, and, and group theory. But he made it clear that um, from, from his perspective, these were only three of the many possibilities. Uh, in my own view, this is, um, uh, well, I'm more attached to this to Poincaré's paper as an introduction to the um, um, to what was going to come than I am to, uh, to, to Hilbert's famous list of problems. Well, uh, anyhow, this is a way to go in by the back door to my main topic, that, that from the very beginning, topology was supposed to be an applied subject. Uh, Poincaré made it clear that it was worth spending this amount of time on it because of, of, of its potential applications. Applications, Yes, all of, all of, uh, all of um, Poincaré's applications were applications to mathematics. And I should make it clear that's what I mean in, in my title, although certainly topology has been applied outside of mathematics as well. Um, speculating about applications, I drew a historical graph, which, um, I mean, the, the dedication to applications both inside and outside of mathematics has not been uniform throughout the um, uh, century, it seems to me. Um, and uh, it sort of was high at the beginning, high at the end, and, and somewhat lower in the middle. I think this is true when you look at mathematics as a, as a whole. Um, well, I've given some, some examples, 
And um, certainly many of the people of Bourbaki are now writing these, these uh, retrospective treatises explaining why at this time it was very important to consolidate the foundations of mathematics. And I think it's also true in um, topology, and that's, that's the main um, uh, subject I want to speak about. In the beginning, of course, Poincaré said it was applied, and there were, and it was very applied in the in the early days. It was uh, the the main people who studied it were were people who were also interested in applications. However, already in 1940, um, in the in the in the 30s, uh, I guess in 1935, there was this enormous topology conference with only topologists present. Um, Already in the 30s, it was uh, sort of drifting off into its own world. Um, an interesting historical remark is in the late 30s, uh, characteristic classes were being developed. So Todd was finding these beautiful cycles on algebraic varieties, and um, Whitney, Stiefel, and Pantriagen were finding these beautiful cycles on uh, topological spaces. There's no evidence reading either side that they had the idea that they might be related. Of course, I mean it was a at least a, at least a ten-year period that both of, that that both groups were doing the same thing before. As so, so so far as one can tell from what they wrote, anyone on either side was aware that they were really doing different aspects of the same thing. So this is some um, measure, perhaps, of isolation. Um, this is just going from what they wrote, as I said. And then we get uh, 1950 to 1970, what Novikov deemed the uh, golden period of topology. This was a period when topology was very much focused on uh, natural questions in the sense of Gromov, uh, classify all manifolds up to homeomorphism, PL equivalence, or uh, smooth, um, uh, e smooth structure. Then, um, well, then something happened, and um, and topology started to um, uh, reintegrate with the with the with the rest of the world. I should mention it never fell down to. I mean, there were always some applications going on. This is only a general trend, and uh, 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 you you may disagree with it. Novikov gave one plausible. Well. Uh, he thinks possible explanation. I will give another uh, for uh, uh, internal topology, but I would urge um, caution on these explanations. Uh, let me tell an anecdote. I showed this uh, graph to uh, Cliff Gertz, who's one of the leading anthropologists, a colleague of mine at the Institute. And he said that in anthropology, the exact same graph is true with the exact same dates. And he could he could list all of the things which would go on at these various times. So of course we like to tell the history of mathematics like we're this independent thing, uh, not not related to the rest of the world, but perhaps we are influenced by some zeitgeist. Anyhow, um, what are the applications of topology? Well, they are. Well, here are some. Uh, topology has been applied to. Algebraic geometry, Lie groups, number theory, combinatorics. I'm not going to speak at all about um, um, these these applications down here or or many others. Uh, partly because I haven't worked in them myself, and and also maybe because they don't fit into my my paradigm quite so neatly. Um, now, if you think about uh, these applications. And think about the spaces that are involved. In every case, except for the case of compact Lie groups, the spaces involved are singular. They are not manifolds. Now, it's a historical fact, which I'll go into in a minute, that this date, 1970, the date that uh, Novikov gave is the date of the collapse of topology, is the date of the foundation of singularity theory. That's what he left to call it. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, 
Um, so my alternative explanation of this phenomenon, uh, at, at least within these fields, uh, look at these early applications. So Cartan was applying topology to the study of, of compact Lie groups. He looked at their um, uh, homology theory using, the, uh, using Durham's theorem. Durham was his student. Uh, okay, so, so that was the smooth case. Lefschetz was looking at algebraic geometry, but he, he was perhaps one of the first people always to put smooth in front as an artificial hypothesis. Algebraic varieties aren't smooth, but Lefschetz decided to study the smooth ones. The uh, 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 generalization of everything he proved to the, to, to the general case had to wait until um, after this um, date. So, so in some sense, the, the applications of topology at the beginning were things which could be treated in, in, in the smooth case. And, and many of the applications at the end, I would say, are because we are now able to, to treat non-smooth spaces on the same basis as smooth ones. Um, okay. So I'm going to come back uh, and, and give some sample um, cases which I've um, chosen among many possibilities uh, at the end. Uh, in earlier talks there have come up uh, some of the applications in algebraic geometry and in uh, uh, group theory, so I'll give some in number theory and combinatorics. Uh, let's make sure we're all talking about... The league group example has singularities when you consider orbits, right? Right, exactly. Uh, and, and there's this incredible Lustig program, you might say, of, of solving almost every problem in algebraic group theory by looking at these singular orbits and looking at the intersection homology of the closures of the orbits. Right. So, so as soon as the group is non-compact, then, then the closures are, are, um, uh, are singular. Oh, um, sorry, maybe I should revert to this. OK, well, a um, singularity is uh, just a uh, point where it's not a manifold. Um, not all of these, I should have said, not all of these uh, spaces here are themselves singular, but uh, they're very often non-compact. Um, for example, that happens with these, this example here, modular varieties. And uh, the, the compactifications you're forced to use will be th themselves stratified or singular. OK, um, and, and another final comment th that uh, somehow singular spaces have so much structure that uh, somehow it's very easy to think of invariance for singular spaces. I mean, because every point has a link, which is itself a manifold of smaller dimensions. So you have all of, these, all of this sort of infinite array of data, or I mean, finite in a given case, but, but potentially infinite. And to put all of that together in a way which will um, actually apply to something, uh, you have to, in my opinion, have, have the applications in mind. That is, the study of singular spaces for their own sake. There are people who do it, but this seems to me a little bit dry um, as a subject. Well, now let me tell, tell, say something about the history of this. Um, before 1960, in um, Novikov's uh, golden period was the Dark Ages. Um, actually, you can look at various works written then, uh, people who, who were trying to say something about um, um, singular spaces. It sort of illustrates Kleinerman's point that when you try to do something uh, in the wrong era, y you won't be able to succeed. I mean, there, there are some very noble but ultimately failing papers written just an indication as to what things were. Bill Fulton told me that when he was a student at Princeton, there was a big debate about whether every point on an algebraic, uh, on a complex algebraic set would have a cone-shaped neighborhood. You know, could there be sort of infinitely many things happening as you approach this? So this was a popular subject of discussion. People 
people were aware of the problem but had no ideas to how it might be solved. Are there any doubts about that? Are they maybe not common? In what category, though? In what category? Co complex algebraic varieties. No, but cone in what category? Oh, topological. Oh. And people doubted that. That's what Bill Fulton told me. I wasn't there. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I, I mean, there was an expected answer, but some people thought, well, maybe it wasn't true. And in any case, they thought that, that you know, it would be very, very hard to prove. Well, anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting. I can't defend it since I didn't, since I wasn't. So Mark's the thesis at that time was proving some, some conical property. Of I see. Property. That era, exactly. I see. OK. Same time. Anyhow, uh, the, there was a huge uh, series of giant steps forward in one decade period. period. Um, there, was, there was Hiranaka who resolved, uh, who uh, found a, a smooth space which mapped to this. Uh, the main point of that is, is, as we think now, that enables you to sort of study a neighborhood of the singular point by using coordinates on the smooth space. Whitney uh, had, had various ideas about uh, various tangent structures you can have. Um, these ideas turned out to be just what you needed in, in order to understand it, but he himself wasn't able to prove that. It was Rene Tom who proved that. And um, well, anyhow, there were huge uh, um, uh, steps forward. Uh, so that at the end of that period, at least topologically, one knew that every singular space was essentially equivalent to, to this picture here. Uh, the, the, all the singular spaces that came up in the slide I have, have have a structure which is perhaps this point is replaced by a manifold and this link is replaced by a bundle, but in any case it's, uh, it, it's essentially some finite structure like that. And then after that there's been a a flowering of many things uh, and applications to all the fields that I was uh, 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 describing at the beginning. Um, perhaps before leaving this, um, let me mention a couple of problems. Uh, the first problem is, well, we really understand the topology of these spaces, but we don't understand their differential geometry. And by that I mean you would sort of distinguish a space like this from a space like this, because here the sort of rate of growth is, is, is different. Well, if that's the only th problem that you met, it would be a pretty trivial thing. But in fact, if you look um, at any reasonable complex algebraic space, the, um, you have many different rates of growth, very complicated sets, all contracting at a different rate all of which the topology completely uh, uh, skips. In some sense, this is why it's very hard to resolve questions about um, L2 cohomology. Um, I had is there an example of a complex algebraic variety which isn't in the Lipschitz category cone-like? Um, no? I yeah, I mean, I think as soon as you look at anything, it's not. But anyhow, maybe we should. So this example singularity on a curve is flat, well, it's so it's cone-like. Yeah, curves, curves, curves are all cone-like. But I think as soon as you go to, to the very first surface singularities, it's not. But in any case, maybe we should discuss that. I mean, I mean, you have these circles in the middle of a thing which are being contracted very fast, whereas the whole thing is not being contracted very fast. So that, I mean, that's what, that. That happens in the very easiest, um, the very first uh, super singularities. Um, anyhow, it seems to me that this is a problem, of a, a very interesting problem to try to invent a structure for this, but uh, it, it may not be one that, we're, that, that mathematics is uh, uh, ready to solve. And also, I don't want to give the impression that uh, singular spaces are the only spaces that come up in applications, which uh, um, Anyhow, it seems to me that spaces that come up with iterative processes, turbulence dynamics, uh, uh, should have also uh, a topology appropriate to those. There are some naive things you can say, but I would guess that there are um, uh, things which haven't been, that, that there's a theory there uh, which so far hasn't been uh, really laid forward. Well, 
In the remaining time, I want to discuss a couple of examples of the paradigm I've been um, presenting, where uh, you look at a class of spaces that comes up in nature and uh, look at nature, meaning other fields of mathematics, and uh, look at the problems that come up with there, and then this leads you to develop new, uh, 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 new topology. So the first example I want to discuss is modular varieties. So these are basically locally symmetric spaces. So this is um, these are these are Riemannian manifolds which have a local involution, meaning that uh, if I have a point on my um, manifold, then there's some neighborhood, so that the um, map of that neighborhood that I obtained by point P, there's some neighborhood, that, so that the map on that neighborhood I obtained by taking X to minus X, that is, I extend the geodesic from X to P by the same distance in the opposite direction, that gives me a little involution if the neighborhood is small enough, and I want that to be an isometry. So this is a beautiful uh, uh, property discovered by Cartan. Then I want them to be complete. That means if I take a geodesic, I can keep on going. I don't fall off the edge of the manifold. Then I want them to be finite volume. Since it's a Riemannian manifold, volume makes sense. And finally, I want them uh, to have uh, an, an arithmeticity problem which I won't describe, but um, it was impl implicitly described in many previous lectures. On the other hand, according to uh, theorems of Margulis, uh, this is automatically true in most cases. So um, by and large, we're just talking about this class of spaces here. OK. These spaces are non-compact. They have these, as uh, drawn here, they have these things these hairs going off the edges. Now, um, what? So something that can be stated just in terms of finite coverings, right? That's the part of Yeah. That's the Right. So it can be stated without, for a high school student. Right? I don't know what it is, but. Oh, uh, what? Uh, Margul? Margulis? No, never mind. Yeah, yeah, OK. But I, but, but I want <laughs> I have something else, okay. some other direction in mind. Um, Yes. Yeah, so, so, so essentially, this means how how pi pi one of this acts on the simply connected covering space is always, and the arithmeticity is 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 how that sits inside the group of all automorphisms of the of the of the simply connected covering space. Now, what do we care about? Uh, what aspects of these spaces do we care about? Uh, we care about their automorphisms, meaning self-maps that preserve all those structures. Well, if you think about it, you can sort of prove to yourself that there would only be finitely many one-to-one -one self maps that preserve all those structures, and so we're forced to, if we want a rich theory, we need to take self-correspondences. So we have here our symmetric space, our, our modular variety. And then we have a uh, correspondence which, which covers it so that this uh, source and target uh, uh, covering map are both um, uh, finite to one and preserve all of the, uh, preserve the metric structure, that is, preserve the structure that I'm interested in. So this is called a HECA correspondence. It differs. Yes, it turns, uh, it turns out that there's an enormous supply of these, always. That's what property 4 means. Yes, of course. By Marcus's theorem. OK. That's what I was trying to say. OK. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was by myself. I wanted to get many good information. OK. Then, um, so, so one, is, one is interested in the, um, 
in the action of these things on on homology and the uh, well let's see the problem that we uh, we addressed was to so I'm talking about joint work with uh, Mark Gresky this is a s series of uh, about five papers of which the last one was just completed last week it's been going on for ten years um, but the 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 problem is to give a geometric uh, uh, computation of L of C, which is equal to the Lefschetz number of C, uh, trace C upper star, mapping, uh, well, some, some homology theory, uh, and it's nice if it at least includes um, uh, intersection homology of a particular compactification to itself. Is unramified? Yes, well that's what I have in mind. I mean, let's let's consider the ones way out there, except for finitely many. Okay. Um, now here's a comment. There's a there's no so so the idea is, is, is to compute this using the Lefschetz fixed point theorem. The Lefschetz fixed point theorem, uh, there can only be a Lefschetz fixed point theorem for compact spaces. So we have to take some compactification in order to, uh, to compute anything or else some compactifying mechanism. Um, there's... What's real complex category? Yeah? Sorry? This category is... We don't assume the commission here. Uh, well... Uh, Right. In the interest of saving time, I'd like to be a little bit vague. Our theorem is 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 completely general and applies to a certain class of of, um, of uh, compactifications, but in particular to apply in in the Hermitian case, it appears it also applies to the intersection homology of the bailey varel compactification, which is, from the point of view of the Langlands program, at least what one 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 cares most about, or or at least current approaches to the Langlands program which, uh, as we all know, are blocked somehow. Uh, OK. Now, uh, so, so you need, anyhow, for, for any theorem like this, oh, oh by the way, uh, the reason for this uh, uh, choice is, well, there are several, but one is one would like to compare with the Arthur uh, trace formula. And um, uh, we've done that. The, 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 this is uh, gives the L2 the trace on the L2 cohomology of, of of X itself, which in this particular case is equal to the intersection homology of an appropriately chosen compactification. By the way, the reason why the the Zucker conjecture was proved, I mean, the reason why we know we're able to understand the L2 cohomology and understand its topological invariance is that this phenomenon I was describing before of the differentiable structure near the singularities where different things grow at different rates. Well, it happens here, but it happens trivially. There are um, sort of at most two rates, and you know exactly what the exponents are, and so you can write everything out. Whereas for a general algebraic variety, it's much more complicated. Okay. Um, now, you need, um, let me make my plug for singular spaces, uh, in order to do such a thing uh, using a Lefschetz idea, you, you, you need a compact space. Uh, as, as many people know, there are many compactifications, and there's the one by Mumford and co-authors, which, which is smooth. However, the Hecke correspondences never extend to that one. So if you want uh, to, to embed this picture in a, um, in a picture where, like this, which you'll need to do in order to prove a theorem uh, of this nature, then you're forced to have singularities um, uh, on the boundary. So you're forced to consider singular spaces. Well, um, I'm not going to, um, to describe the, the details of the um, construction. As I say, it's five, five long papers. Um, I love the details a lot, but let me at least say 
say this, that uh, it forced us to prove a new topological Lefschetz fixed point theorem. That is, uh, to, to, get a, to actually do the calculations of, of the components of the fixed points. I mean, we, we want this to be a sum over fixed points of something which we can actually compute in order to make this work. Uh, so, so in order to get something that you, you, uh, uh, you can actually compute, we had to write a, a new Lefschetz fixed point theorem, which was fun in itself and has, has found uh, separate applications. So it's a, an illustration of the general principle that uh, when you, as a topologist, you study spaces and questions that come from other domains, you're, you're led to, to interesting things. Actually, instead, I'd like to... Uh, uh, bring up another couple of problems. First of all, what is the complexity of some some homology calculation for for x or x bar? Actually, this question really doesn't depend uh, so much on whether I've compactified or not. Uh, the, the question is, how can you store in a computer the topology of X in such a way that you can compute its, its homology? Well, there's quite a bit of technology on this. I mean, you know, we like to think we can compute the homology of everything, but actually in this case, it's not the, uh, it's not the case. Uh, symmetric spaces uh, roughly divide into two big domains the linear and the Hermitian and they intersect in in SL2 which as we learned is the one that the analytic number theorists like most oh dear uh, no, there's a whole classification, but GLN is linear. Yeah, right. Um, linear means that um, basically what it means is that I can put a on the on the symmetric space itself. I can put a a linear structure where uh, you know if I given two points, I can conduct can connect them by a line. Well, maybe that's every space because I can take a geodesic. And then if I'm given three points and connect those three lines, then there's then if I draw all of the lines like this, I get the same surface as if I drew all of the lines like this. So, and, and so on, uh, as I go up. And this is obviously a good thing if you want to triangulate a space, because it means if you sprinkle points in there, you can start getting triangles out of the sprinkling of points. Now, I don't claim that there's a theorem that there is no such structure on, on the ones which aren't, don't fall in this class. But nobody's ever found one, and uh, if you did find one, it would solve a very big problem. So, yeah, that's a th yeah. Uh, basically, I'm describing a projective structure, but not not necessarily. Well, I mean, it doesn't make sense to ask if it's compatible with the metric. Yeah. Okay. Now, because of works of Voronoi again in this century, but at the beginning of it, uh, Voronoi and following his ideas. Uh, he was an amazing mathematician who died sort of right in the middle of writing a series of papers on this. Uh, you can write a computer algorithm for uh, um, calculating the homology of all of those. But in fact, you can write, no one even knows how to write a computer algorithm. So, so these are computable. Uh, well, you can write an, a, a computer algorithm, but then there's a matter of the growth of the algorithm. And the, uh, I'm, and the algorithm grows so fast that, um, that SL3 is the last one that anyone has actually been able to do enough calculations to give an instance of the Langlands program by, by, by actually doing this. Um, now, there are, to my knowledge, only two other examples here where you even know of a computer algorithm. One is the Hilbert modular surface. And the other is the Ziegel modular threefold. fold 
And this was joint work with Mark McConnell. One of the hardest papers I was ever involved in. Uh, so for all of the others, even in this in principle algorithm, it's just unknown. On the other hand, um, so, so, so what does this Voronoi algorithm do? It actually displays the thing as a cell complex. Um, on, on the other hand, one has the feeling that you're doing something wrong here because this grows so fast. So perhaps there's something more efficient to Where do. Where's the modular space? Is that over there on the right? Um, the, it's, it's, not, it's, it's widely regarded as being analogous to these, and, and, and you can say similar things. That's right. There, there it would, and, and, in, and in fact, if you know that algorithm, the ones over here are, are, are really quite similar to that. And even this one, the one we found for that, is really quite similar to that. Um, anyhow, one, one has the feeling that you've made a, a, a bad uh, computer science judgment by deciding to triangulate this space. On the other hand, triangulation or cell complexes is virtually the only way we know how to present a, a, an, an arbitrary space on a computer. So I have the feeling that there's something missing here. This is definitely relevant to... Uh, Could you estimate how difficult is structure, including so standard iterations and so on? Could you look to the answer, not the way of computation, and to see right. whether you could step in? Uh, right, this is sort of what I'm suggesting. I mean, when, when, when I mean, there's a whole community of mathematicians that, that works on this, and they keep hitting a sort of a glass ceiling here. And when that happens, as, as we were told in earlier lectures, uh, doing exactly the kind of thing that you're suggesting is a, it, uh, seems to be a good idea. It seems to me this question is at least relevant to, uh, to Peter Sarnak's question, what is the uh, reason for the um, success of these spaces in, in, in answering questions in number theory, because it does appear that these spaces are incredibly complicated, at least the best, the, the best algorithms we have, in the case where we have any algorithm, is, a, is incredibly complicated, whereas we are able to extract information out of them by various means. For example, we were able to extract this information. I mean, it's not... It's not surprising. It's always easier when you take an alternating sum. In fact, that was in Poincaré's original paper. But, um, uh, but the answer to this is just far less complex to, than, than the answer to that. Uh, while I'm at it, because we're supposed to speculate wildly, let me uh, add one of my favorite uh, uh, speculations. Can you consider... Uh, the action of C as a dynamical system. Basically, I'm suggesting two fields of mathematics which have not yet been brought to bear on, on modular varieties. I mean, they sit in the middle of all mathematics. They touch almost anything, everything. Um, well, C, in order to do this, we had to calculate the fixed points of C. So the fixed points... Um, yes, but the, the, um, it, it turns out that the interesting dynamics are on each piece. Uh, it's basically hyperbolic near infinity. So, uh, yes, on the, compactifi on the compactification, but it will be equivalent to doing it on the interior, the same depth. That's true of both of these questions, really. I mean, we understand the singularities. It's the interior that we don't understand. But in this case, even if you take a compact portion, the still question exists. Yeah. So the, Both. the, the question is not related to the uh, compactification. Right. If you take a case when the compact portion asks the same question. Right. Neither, neither of these what questions. The question, uh, the question. Say, how compact is This one? Has it done well, uh, for, I mean, first of all, you have to make sense of it. So far as I know, people who study dynamical systems have not considered one-to-many maps, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Oh, I'm wrong? Okay. Okay. <laughs> there, 
but not that they don't satisfy a certain property, which is very important to street groups or in, in the general business. Anyhow, here, here's, here's a case where you know in advance that the thing contains some of the deepest information we have in all of mathematics, and yet the, the set of fixed points are the set of recurrent points you can compute, and they are not so complicated. So maybe there's something interesting going on. What did you say? You, you know that's, that these things, C, contain some of the deepest right. mathematics around, but the computing their fixed points or recurrent po or, or points of finite order is not so complicated. And so, um, it, well, anyhow. So maybe this deepness is in the other part of the dynamics. Yeah, dynamic. right, right. Okay. Yeah, maybe there's something beautiful going on in dynamics. But they're dynamic essentially independent, right, on, on, on geometry and the line of geometry, if you look right? Yes, uh, this will be so extraordinarily non-generic. Hmm? As a dynamical system, this will be extraordinarily non-generic. If you change geometry of the space, you have the same dynamics, if you look at the oil it's change geometry. I don't, space, I, actually, I don't know how to change the geometry preserving no, the whole problem. You have your compact space, yeah, compact. Yeah. yeah. change the line of geometry of the manifold. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, I mean... How much group theoretical, how much of German uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, anyhow, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. No, no, no. These dynamics, because these maps are local isometries, have a certain property. Right? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. volume preserving, they're, volume preserving, they're, so I mean, you can they're isometries. Uh, Um, in my remaining two minutes, I'd like to just say a couple of words about another problem, sort of as an excuse for philosophical comment. Um, as you may, well, as, as has come up all, uh, also, this is from combinatorics. Um, polytopes lead to algebraic varieties it, by, a, by a construction you take the well my version you take the polytope you take the cone over the polytope in one higher dimensional space and then um, so that gives you a, a cone oh I should say rational polytopes so, what is the uh, let's just make the integrals the uh, vertices lattice points after some scaling. The convex sets? Yeah. Uh, the convex all of a finite number of lattice points. Well, uh, maybe I won't say much about this except to say that this toric variety is, is uh, pieced together out of a bunch of, of tori, uh, one for each face of the polytope, and the angles of the faces of the polytope uh, give uh, how to glue those tori uh, to each other. So I don't think anything I could say in two minutes would add to this. But I do want to make a, um, a philosophical comment. Uh, the idea that there should be strong interaction between uh, topology and combinatorics goes back at least to Whitney, who was a founder of both fields. Uh, he certainly felt that, that there should be an interaction, but the example that he had was mainly simplicial complexes, which is a very um, inefficient way of building a complicated topology from a combinatorial uh, set. This uh, toric variety construction, instead of sort of putting together sim simplices, puts together tori, and that's a little more efficient. So you, you can build a fairly complicated space out of a fairly simple polytope, and that's, that's somehow why it's useful, I would say. And that may also illustrate what I have in mind with this question here. Uh, the only things that we've been able to do so far are to try to build these spaces out of contractible pieces, but maybe there's some m more clever thing that we just haven't been able to conceive of which will help. Out of this 
object. No, wait, wait. Um, an algebraic geometric object you have. This is uh, this something that allows you to compute the homology. Yeah, yeah. I, something that that you can write an algorithm to compute the homology. That's what I ask. Um, okay. Well, um, so we had a very pleasant experience, Tom Braden and I. Uh, worked on a, a, a conjecture of, of, of Gil Kalai. Um, there was some, some noise during Gil's talk that perhaps he shouldn't be calling his things conjectures, but let me tell you that we got a lot of fun out of one of those conjectures. And it turned out to be, uh, to lead to very interesting new, new topology. Well, I'll state the conjecture, but perhaps not the, the proof. You see, this is a singular space. And so uh, we can say g of the polytope is equal to the intersection Poincaré polynomial of this part space, the space that, that I've um, calculated there. That space is contractible, by the way. Somehow it all contracts down to a point. But uh, intersection homology is not a homotopy invariant, so it still has very interesting intersection homology groups. Um, and uh, Gill's uh, uh, conjecture was that g of p, this, this turns out, to, uh, I should say, I won't give the algorithm, but this turns out to depend only on the uh, combinatorics of the space, how the, the, how the, the, spaces, how, how the various spaces uh, uh, fit to each other. So there's a relation one can give. There are many ways to give it. And uh, the fact that, that this is positive is, a very is one of the strongest statements we have ab about the um, uh, possible combinatorics of polytopes. Of course, we have it only where the toric variety exists, so only for rational polytopes, which, by the way, Definition? yes. We, uh, but this doesn't show that it's a combinatorial invariant. Um, anyhow, Gill's uh, uh, conjecture was that uh, g of p is uh, bounded from below by g of any face times g of p divided by that face. You see, if I take a face of this thing after making it a cone and sight along a ray, then what I'll have left will be another uh, cone. And so, so that's what this is. And greater than or equal means every uh, power of t, the coefficient here, is bigger than the uh, product there. For a triangle, when f is an edge, what is p mod f? Um, for a triangle, if f is an edge, p mod f is, is, a, uh, is a line segment, and therefore p is a point. Triangle. Well, I mean. What's the operation of convex sets? If you have a phase, uh, have take a take a nearby plane that sort of slices the thing off. If you have a if this is f, then p mod f would be oh. that thing. I mean, what what part of the figure is p mod f? Sorry, this the sort of the link. Okay, so this is some, some. This gives, I mean, it hasn't been explored, but gives some um, quadratic statements about uh, uh, possible numbers of edges and faces. And um, as in the case of the uh, Lefschetz thing, it led to very interesting um, unknown statement in topology that was a lot of fun to 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 play with. Okay, well, um, let me stop. Perhaps if I'm to make a moral, uh, let me uh, state it this way. I mean, in some sense, maybe what I'm doing is appealing for the unity of mathematics. People should look at problems that come from other fields. But really, I don't want to do that uh, because uh, um, I don't like it when people say other mathematicians should do something for the good of mathematics. Uh, I think mathematics is best served when everybody goes out and does, the, uh, does their what appeals to them most, 
um, unlike the National Science Foundation that tries to push us to do otherwise. But um, maybe I should put the moral this way. If you're a mathematician and you want to work on a problem which will continue to be fun and which will avoid the twin dangers of Gromov, which are basically dangers which mean that you'll hit a you'll start to work on a problem and spend a lot of time and then it'll turn out that it won't uh, lead anywhere and you'll, you'll be left with an unfun toy. If you want to avoid that, then a good thing is to work on problems that have already been tested in some other subject and are known to be deep. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, for uh, that's what uh, uh, Braden and I, and I proved for rational polytopes, and then for the others, this is a big unknown with various ideas floating around. Is there a definition for alpha one? Sorry. Is there a definition for alpha one? Many, many. <laughs> yes, many definitions. Maxime has one. There, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are others, but. Uh, <laughs> right. But, well, <laughs> I didn't give it. The, what definition they ask you about? Uh, something which would be the intersection homology of an irrational polytope if you gave an irrational polytope. And yes, there, there are a number of complexes that you can write down uh, which uh, do calculate the, which, to which the integrality of the vertices is, has, has no bearing at all and which do calculate this group if, if the vertices are integral and make sense otherwise. And so one can, one can and does make the same conjecture about, uh, uh, about all polytopes, but uh, it's unproved. So, uh, in this, uh, have you ever encountered some kind of luscious trace form of Hikiki correspondence which are not finite? What, um, do you have a, perhaps you could show me an example, I, I, well, uh, I mean, what you give in mind is not exactly Hegel correspondence, but was something analogous to that, but, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Right, so, so, so according, uh, the question concerned uh, uh, things which are like Hecke correspondences, but, but in which the maps S and T are not finite. And uh, so and immediately my principle is that one shouldn't take this as an abstract question, but one, one should look at the example. So I would like very much to see, <laughs> to see your example. Yeah, you mentioned that this can be actually related to the Langlands conjecture. You mentioned Langlands in the beginning of the lecture. Yeah. So can you say exactly what you mean? <laughs> well, I'm uh, how many lectures are going here are going to explain the Langlands conjecture? <laughs> in, in no, the Langlands conjecture uh, says that I mean these 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 um, C's in general are parameterized by things like primes, and the Langlands conjecture says that the that this that the action, well, this, this number, or the action of this, as you vary over the different primes, should contain number theoretic information about those primes. So perhaps there should be an algebraic variety that it counts the points on, or perhaps the, uh, something, uh, something like so this. So this computation can be made to support it, you say? Sorry? In your computation, you should make support in some examples. You can compute the traces for overall primes. Yes, uh, yes, you can compute them, you give a long formula, and then there's a whole uh, program sketched out by Langlands and his students. But in this particular case, you compute it. Yes. How it, what it, how it bears with respect to general conjectures. Well, you it confirms it's, it's exactly no, 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 I don't say it confirms it. Um, then, then that fits into a long program which uh, uh, Langlands and his students are pursuing, which uh, has as the goal to actually prove the Langlands conjecture, and so you have another long formula coming no, from no, the. I, we know that, but yes, you said that what you computed. Yes. You no, 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 no. He made a very clear statement about the Langlands conjecture that was perfectly understandable to me, and I don't know what the Langlands conjecture was. He just said that the compactification that he needed to make this theorem true, in some cases, was the one they want to use in their attempt to prove the Langlands conjecture. Uh, this is what you said. That's just what he said. So whatever language you have to read, you don't even know what it is. No, 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 but he said another statement. Some computation. 
Did you also edit the Shoshone Chinese? No, we, this is only a step in, in a, <laughs> no, I mean, the Langlands conjecture is not, doesn't have the structure that you can usually take the answer and say, ah, yes, that corresponds no, to arithmetic. No, no, no. Okay, so I will resume in 10 minutes.